Welcome everybody to the um, 49th edition of Beers with Bill. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome back uh, Troy Birch from uh, Great Lakes Brewing and also my pleasure to welcome Mike Lackey uh, for the first time on the show. Mike, welcome to Beers with Bill. Which beer are we going to start with, Troy? Uh, we should do the Great Lakes Lager. Um, for those of you that are not in Toronto, uh, it probably hasn't hit the LCBO in your area yet. Um, but it just it just went live the other day and it's already starting to roll out. So uh, if for those of you that have it, we would do that one first. <laughs> Thanks, Terry and Emma. <laughs> um, what if we don't have that one? Um, you can watch Lackey and I drink it. <laughs> Isn't that the best way? Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, I don't have it. <laughs> all right well i'll have it yeah if you have a, if you have a lager of any sorts um so uh lackey's got an absacker which is great uh so bill do you want to just do you want us to go right into the first beer or uh sure if you want to start talking about the first beer that'd be great perfect well um lackey why don't you, you we'll do this tonight you'll talk about the beer i'll talk about the other stuff around the beer so um the, the first beer is the Great Lakes Lager. Um, it's not a rebrand of Golden Horseshoe. So sorry, Kat, it's not. Um, it's a brand new beer. Uh, is, is my audio okay or is are you guys getting feedback? I'm getting feedback on something. Um, so uh, yeah, we, we launched this in uh, February as a full-time brand and we killed Blonde Lager, which was previously uh, Golden Horseshoe, which was previously Golden Horseshoe Premium Lager, which was formerly Great Lakes Lager, which was formerly Lager. Um, and so after six years or 16 different names and different rebrands, uh, this is the one we've settled on. Um, uh, the write up on the back of the can talks a lot about uh, what's on the front of the can. Um, and for those of you who have it, I always, I always read along um, verbatim from the back of the can just because it's fun to do. Um, but this retro label dates back to 1987, the year of our incorporation, and has been reborn in an effort to honor our past. The elements in the crest provide a glimpse into, well, we're not quite sure, but the design was groundbreaking in the 1980s, so we're good with it. Great Lakes Lager, a throwback to our humble beginnings. Um, so, yeah, we came out with this in, in February to replace Blonde Lager. Uh, Lackey will talk about the recipe and how it differs. Um, we, we did get some pushback when we, when we launched this beer, there's a lot of people in Ontario, uh, that fell in love with blonde lager because it has been around. It's part of the heritage of Great Lakes for over 30 years. Um, and, uh, but it's been selling really well. And just in the last three weeks, it's actually surpassed our, uh, uh, Canuck Pale Ale is the number one selling brand for retail, um, through home delivery and our retail store. So. Tomas, you got to get ordering more Canuck to get those numbers back up. Um, but uh, it's it hit the LCBO, like I said, uh, uh, today's Tuesday. I, it hit on Friday. Um, and it's going to be going into 300 plus stores. Uh, we're going to do a big, well, it's going to be a big continuous run running all the way at least until October. Um, so we have some big plans for this one. Uh, and when the bars and restaurants open up, we hopefully will have uh, a lot of taps pouring this. Um, and Lackey, you want to talk about uh, the beer itself? Uh, yeah, sure. First, the uh, kind of the name and logo. Uh, just wanted to mention that Ben Gibbs, a uh, guy who was our kegger for a bunch of years, great guy at Great Lakes. Uh, he saw an old poster that had the, the logo on uh, that we, we put on the can now. And he said, uh, he was like, that'd be great. This is an amazing logo. Why aren't we calling the beer this? Uh, it was a bit of a stretch at the time, I think, but it was a first idea. And I, I thought it was a great idea. So we've kind of gone to a, a, a retro look, which hopefully works. Um, but for the beer itself, I, I kind of always with the blonde lager and the horseshoe, uh, to be honest, it wasn't my favorite. Um, the recipe was, you know, pretty American lager uh based uh which is fine for a lot of people but wasn't my favorite so i, I always kind of wanted to push to you know a little more bitterness a little more hop flavor you know you're not a, not a ton because uh, i don't want to uh, alienate too many of the blonde drinkers 
but uh, so we worked on recipes kind of over the years on small system and, you know, Peter, uh, Peter Bullet, the owner and other people were a little hesitant to change because why broke what's, uh, or why fix what's not broken. But uh, we thought we could make it better and we have a few new techniques for lager making at the brewery. We got some better equipment. Uh, for lager making, better filtration equipment that we could do at higher pressures, uh, fil uh, filter well carbonated, stuff like that. Um, so I think as we work on this beer, it's going to be a real nice, you know, it's, it's got there. There's a couple other things I'd like to tweak with it. And uh, I think it's going to be a real nice uh, lager to, to, uh, to go to for, you know, your for uh, lager drinkers and for, for beer lovers. Um, I, I like to find a nice mix. We went from about uh, 12 IBU, the, the blonde lager was of the horseshoe, and we brought it up to 18, which I think kind of makes a real, gets it to a real nice point where uh, it's nice and crisp and not too sweet. Uh, and then we've changed the finishing hop from Pearl to Saws. So Saws gives it that nice kind of spicy finish um more than the uh the blonde lager had a little bit of grassy finish of the yeah grassy yeah. yeah yeah so it's um it's interesting to see and so tomas uh is on the call he used to work at gray lakes and so is rob uh under uh, uh i'm trying to read your profile name uh anyway bobo uh wave yeah uh he used to work at gray lakes so um not not many of us used to drink the blonde lager around the brewery um and uh you'll see a number of us now drinking the the, the i almost call the golden horseshoe a uh, number of us drinking the great lakes lager which is uh which is great to see and uh mike mentioned that he, they're still uh refining it and i think that um that speaks to a lot of the brands that we have at the brewery right now is um and mike maybe you can touch on the lager series the the german lagers and how those have improved um, batch over batch because of the new techniques that you were just mentioning? Uh, yeah, we had um, a trip or a couple trips to Germany uh, 2019 when we still could, obviously. Uh, I went, we went to Brau, which is a big beer festival over there, uh, an industry beer festival. Um, managed to make a couple friends and we ended up uh, making a good enough friend that the brewer from um, What's the brewery, Troy? It's on the back of your can. Brewer uh, Rittmeyer. Yeah. Sorry, Rittmeyer. <laughs> Kevin from Rittmeyer uh, came over to Canada, actually, and did a collab with us. Uh, Absacker was the first one. And just very subtle things, but just a couple of changes that he suggested we make. Uh, he insisted on that we had to spoon the beer, uh, which is natural carbonation during fermentation. Uh, without that kind of the lager, which doesn't have a lot of, you know, your flaked oats or dry hopping or wheat, uh, wheat that gives, uh, a lot of your pale ales kind of a, a big head retention, um, with a lager that the spooning is, is really key to have a nice head retention and, uh, and really improve the, improve the beer. So that was something that we focused on from that. And a couple of the tips he gave, gave us with recipe. Um, they were very, very subtle and almost what we were doing, but not quite, but made a huge difference. And we could tell right away. And uh, so from there, we've kind of run with it. And he helped us a lot, I would say, just, uh, but that often happens in brewing. If you, <clears throat> you reach out and you travel and you get inspired by people and you get a couple tips here and there, and then, and then you, you run with it and your beer really improves. Besides. Terry and Emma, you're drinking fru shopping. Has anyone had any of the German lagers that we've been putting out over the last year and a half? The Afrischen, nice. That's probably one of my favorite ones that we've done for, and it's really good. Um, we've we've done uh, Absacker, which is a, a Hellas. We've done uh, the Humber Hellas, which is out right now. Um, it's a gluten reduced uh, Hellas. Uh, Old Dusseldorf Alt beer, uh, Zy Ziegen which is a Doppelbach, uh, Fru Schoppen, Laurel Lager. Um, I'm missing a whole bunch. Uh, Vienna, which we're going to try tonight, which not uh, yet. So uh, so we started doing these alphabet uh, German beers, and I think that was inspired by Lackey as well, too, the, 
the look and uh, the, the styles. Um, so we're really pleased with those. And the fruit shopping has been a big hit since we, we first launched it uh, back in 2000, late 2019, I believe we launched it the first time. Uh, Bill, do you want us to go into a second beer or do you have some questions? I've got a whole pile of questions. Oh, perfect. But we probably, um, I'm sure we're going to run longer than an hour, but we should probably hit on to the second beer now. Okay. So we have uh, Sunnyside or Vienna Lager. I think we should go with the, the Sunnyside um, before we get into uh, to the to the Vienna and the and pompous ass. I hope everyone was able to track down some Sunnyside. It's it's out there at the LCBO. Um, I think it's hitting grocery stores uh, next week as well. Um, this one was. Um, uh, telling secrets, it was a huge surprise for us last summer um, when COVID hit and lockdowns happened and home deliveries kicked off. Um, we we were experiencing huge uh, home delivery numbers, um, and then it came time for Sunnyside. And every time we did a batch and we canned it, um, we would sell out of seven or eight pallets just for home delivery within a week. Um, we were we were stocking out every single time, um, so this year we went a little bigger, and hopefully, uh, hopefully it, we have the same response as last year. Um, we updated the can from last year. Uh, hopefully, everyone's noticed that all of our core brands are year-round: uh, Canuck Pale Ale, Pompous Ass, uh, Octopus Wants to Fight, and now Haze Mama and Burst. Uh, they've all undergone um, a rebrand. Uh, we've also redone uh, Karma Citra, Thrust and IPA, um, Lake Effect, and then Sunnyside. So we wanted to get back more to the original concept that we thought years ago uh, was just the Sunnyside Pavilion. Um, and then somehow Roland slipped back onto the front of the can. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be coming out with a new audio or new audio and uh, video uh, assets uh, this week. Uh, our voiceover actor did a great job of retelling the story of the new Roland. Um, so this one's at the LCBO right now. It's 290 a can, 3.9%. Um, uh, it's the same great recipe, the same great beer that always has been. Uh, Lackey, do you wanna do you wanna talk about the beer? And actually, we had to release it. Here's the story. We had to release it early this year, so we did. Uh, we did a couple small batches on our uh, pilot system. Uh, I believe it was on the pilot system where we, we scaled up onto the big system, but we released it early just for retail. That was the reason we told people, but it was so Lackey could drink it April 1st uh, for the, the Jay's home opener. That's true. That is a true story. Pathetic, but true. Um, yeah, Sunnyside, uh, Sunnyside we, we named it after... Uh, well, Sunnyside Pavilion, we used to go down there when we were teenagers growing up in Blair West Village to drink, uh, drink beer, sit around a, a bonfire. So uh, that was kind of the inspiration for that. Uh, when we released it, we, you know, we had session IPA it was something that really, we really wanted to, to make and, uh, and it was, you know, pretty successful, but it, it, it seemed to take a couple of years, maybe two, three years to to catch on and we, we were starting to think uh i was starting to think like is this you know it's a it's it's a west coast session ipa it's not uh, the new school east coast it's not super hazy um not super juicy necessarily uh but maybe a little bit of a hybrid uh so we started thinking is this really the right beer maybe we go away from this uh but then as troy said last year it just really seemed to to hit and we just keep kept hearing like, wow, Sunnyside is back. This is amazing. This is the best it's ever been. And it, it did seem to get some legs. Um, so hopefully that's the case. And I, I love it. Uh, I go back to it every year and it's like, oh, that's that, that it tastes like Sunnyside. And it really has, has got its own, uh, its own voice now. Bill, do you, do you, want, you might as well jump in and ask some questions now, I guess. <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate that, Troy. <laughs> Mike, you've been with Great Lakes Brewing 
almost from day one. I know not quite, but almost from day one. And um, I was doing some research yeah. and I, I got the um, beer journal from uh, the 30th anniversary interview where uh, Peter literally, you know, you have put in 10,000 hours in the brewery. Is that remotely close or is it more than that? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, it's probably more than that. I uh, I always loved the brewery, like right from day one, uh, coming right out of high school when I heard the bullets, they were they were growing up, they were friends growing up, family friends. When they bought a brewery, it was just like, oh, that's what I want to do. So I've just hung out at the brewery for 30 years. I like, you know, after work, I like staying at the brewery. Uh, I like coming in early. I like when I'm there. I like working there. So yeah, I, I've, I've lived it. Uh, when I go on vacation, we do beer stuff. We go to other breweries. So it doesn't really stop. Uh, I know tough job, but somebody's got to do it. But uh, it's kind of something that I fell into, I guess. But I've loved it and lived the lifestyle. And uh, yeah, it's been great. It's been a good ride. I haven't checked for a while, but is your Twitter handle, your Twitter bio still, you're going to be a monk and then. Yeah. <laughs> Benedictine monk. Benedictine monk. Yeah. I wasn't really though. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, yeah. The 10,000 hours we we've joked around with Lackey about that for a couple of years now when uh, Malcolm Gladwell came out with that book, um, uh, you put in 10,000 hours to become an expert in your field. Uh, we used to joke that Lackey would brew like on that small pilot system, 50 to 100 liters at a time, depending on the style. And he would do three batches a day, some days, five days a week, just so that we could, you know, back in the day, go to kickoff with one keg of something special. Um, and if it was a good beer, like, say, Karma Citra, he would keep brewing that for a whole week so that we'd have maybe 10 kegs or whatever it would be so we could sell it to bars and restaurants for a bit. So. I think a lot of those styles, he won't give himself a lot of credit on that, but a lot of the styles like uh, and the, the brands that we've created over the 2010 onwards, um, those all came from a small 50 to 100 liter or whatever it was, a 70 liter system uh, that have been scaled up. And you know, now we're producing uh, 200,000 cans of something uh, on a run, um, not on a specific run, but numerous batches and it all started on a seven liter system which is uh pretty pretty amazing well that then that leads me to my next question for mike i mean after 30 years and and literally being there for all the ups and downs that great lakes has gone through and all the major changes is there anything that can surprise you now uh yeah i i think so yeah the i mean you think you, yeah, you think you know what's going on. And then the last year certainly has surprised a lot of us. Uh, but then you think you make predictions about, oh, this is what's going to happen during, uh, you know, a stay at home period, but it's been the opposite. I mean, Sunnyside is an example where we thought we kind of knew where that was going, but then it, it picked up with the pandemic. Um, you know, we thought we didn't know where sales were going to go and now we're doing home delivery. So yeah, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, there's lots that still surprises you, for sure. I mean, it's it's always fun. Like it's it is always something new, and it, there's different uh, ways the industry goes. So, yeah, definitely. Do, do you miss the 70 liter system now that you have a bigger pilot system? No, no. I hate I hate <laughs> that thing. It's still at the brewery, and it, and people are like, we should put it out somewhere or get it going again. I'm like, no, I, no, I don't want anything to do with. <laughs> The small batches scrounging to make it 20 liter. It's I uh, no, I like the big big system where you get a good volume and the most frustrating thing if you made a good batch, which you know hopefully I did sometimes, uh, it was gone before. Oh, that was really good, and it's gone. It's like no, this is no, I'm I'm done with that. Yeah, there is a we we used to do um, on the small system a beer called Dimitri Fong for Hungry Brew Hops in Newmarket. Um, and I can't remember the, the year we started doing that, but there was an issue every single time we brought the staff down, the staff would help out. And every single time 
the five hour brew day would take eight. There was always something wrong where one of our brewers didn't get the caustic out before they started running in the beer or the, the wort. Um, it would always get clogged where the hops would, um, uh, it was just, it was a nightmare uh, to bring in groups to do a beer and then it would last uh, a lot longer than the normal. And then he would have to do two, two batches instead of one. So his days were always a lot longer, but in the winter, he was always gone for that mid afternoon. He would go play shinny. So that would extend the brew day a couple of times too through the, through the winter. I can appreciate that. Where's your favorite place to play shinny, Mike? Sorry, to play shinny? Mm -hmm. uh, Rennie Park, which is uh, in Swansea, kind of South Blue West Village, where that's I grew up there. So I've been on that ring since I was five years old. So uh, yeah. Like to get to work early in the winters and then sneak out around one o'clock for a couple hours and uh, play outdoor shinny. <laughs> There's a bunch of guys who've been going down there for well, 40, 40 years. So. so, yeah, it's a lot of fun. We have fun. But imagine, not this year. <laughs> I imagine it isn't. I'm sure you're missing it this year. You missed it this year, didn't you? Yeah. No. Missed it totally. Yeah, it was, uh, it hurt. But he got into biking instead, and now he's a cyclist. <laughs> That's right. Troy, Keep I, I'm sure we've discussed this before, but um, <coughs> is, is the artwork all done in-house, or do you guys have an, uh, someone doing it for you? It's all in-house. Um, uh, Patrick Corrigan is our artist. Uh, he is uh, he's still with the Toronto Star. He does the Saturday political cartoon. Um, but he, he retired about five years ago from doing it as a five day a week job. Um, so he does all the illustrations, all the art. Uh, and then Fabian Skidmore is our, um, uh, he somehow got the, the highest title outside of president at the brewery. He's our art director. Um, so he oversees, uh, he's a graphic designer. Um, and, uh, but he does a lot of the content on the cans now. He writes a lot of the copy. Um, he works with Patrick on the look and the style. Um, and so two different, very different looks um, where you have the cartoonish look and then you go back to this uh, old retro label that Fabian had to redraw. Um, uh, anyway, yeah, so the, the two of them work on every single beer label that we, we put out. Um, we do have um, one or two guys that work on our packaging line, uh, Emmett and Dylan, who've done labels for us in the past as well. Uh, so uh, sometimes it calls for some different art and we, we've, we've stuck to in-house on that. And for those of you who, who noticed that the um, Beers with Bill little social media thing was much nicer this, this week, you can thank Troy because he sent it off to his art department <laughs> to fix it up for me. <laughs> Our art department's very smart. It's one guy, you know. Uh, I sent it over to him. I just said, "Here, have a look at this," and he's like, "I can, I can, I can spruce it up a tad for him." <laughs> totally appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Gave me some new ideas to work with, starting <laughs> nice. in the in in uh, the second season. So nice. <laughs> so, what's been the biggest challenge, Troy, um, through the last little bit of COVID for you? Uh keeping up with all the me personally as in my role is putting up with um uh or trying to get through all of the the weekly releases that we do um i, I think i mentioned this on the last uh uh call that we did but we've redone all of our labels so we've done a different format different template um not just the the new look of the characters but we've rebranded and rejigged everything on the label um so every time we do something new, we have to go through that process again. And in 2020, we released, I think the number was just under 120 different beers. Um, so uh, it, we brought Fabian in full time um, uh, to, because we just couldn't, we weren't managing without him being a full-time staff. Uh, so that's been one challenge. I think uh, <laughs> the biggest one, and no one talks about it, is the, the mental health that being at home with your kids and daycare is closed and school and 
Uh, so trying to juggle your actual job and then family commitments and, and that stuff, that's been a big stress. Um, and then the retail store is trying to keep up there with, uh, with all the changes, um, whether it be legislative or, um, or just public perception of you shouldn't be selling clothing or you, why do you have four people in the store, not one? Um, and so a lot of that. Uh, and then from, I don't think anyone on this call, but we get a lot of questions about our home delivery. Um, how come we're not going out to Kitchener Waterloo? Uh, you go to Hamilton, how come you don't go to Richmond Hill? Um, and so those have been, those have been, we get out of 50 of those messages a week, I would say. Um, so it, it's something that we'll be looking at again to see if we expand home delivery, but if it's anything like last summer, uh, there's no way we'll be able to accommodate it with the, the staff that we have and the number of vehicles that we, we own. Yeah. Mike, with, with all the beers that you've made and all the, all the releases that you've had in the last year, is there any beer that you haven't made that you wish you had made? Uh, uh, they would probably just do it if they wanted to do it. Yeah. <laughs> and then yeah, I don't think so. And then tell us, say you have two weeks to come up with a, a name, label, artwork. Yeah. That, they, just did that. they just did that <laughs> three weeks. weeks. Ago. It's a lot of time. Yeah. You just did that three weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. That was about a week and a half. Uh, <laughs> no, Bill, we're like, we're really lucky. Uh, the brood team, we, we uh, have free reign pretty much. So. Peter's really good with that, and uh, Troy is not good with it, but he puts up with it. Uh, I love it. Of, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, we and we have a good team. You know, there's there's four or five of us now. Uh, a lot of guys with different ideas, and if there's a new idea, we have we have a lot. You know, we have good. Uh, we have a lot of tanks too, often, and uh, skilled brewers, so we can uh, produce kind of whatever we're thinking, kind of whenever we want, and hopefully it turns out i mean it doesn't always turn out perfect but uh, that's what we try to do i think that if i can jump in i think the biggest um surprise to me with, with all the beers we released in 2020 and even into 2021 are the english style beers um the monty mild the monty esp the monty brown ale those beers are selling it within two weeks and that's something in the past that that would that wouldn't happen and the monty esp um i think we've done that four times now and it's probably the one beer outside of our big IPAs that um, we get the most correspondence from people, whether it be DMs through social or uh, emails saying, when is the ESB coming back? How come I can't find that? Um, I got two today. We sent our newsletter out today and someone literally after they read it, I guess, they messaged right back saying, um, where'd the Montes go? I'm getting a 404 on the website. Um, and uh, so I'm, I, I've been surprised with, uh, with the Monty series and how well they've done um, in 2020, 2021. I'm going to ask one question and then we should probably get that third beer going. Um, someone's curious as to how many new addresses have you added to your system in the last year with, with home delivery? Um, so we do all of our home deliveries ourselves with our own staff and our own vehicles. Um, we didn't do home delivery before COVID. Uh, March 17th, I believe it was, we shut down the store by March 23rd. We had home delivery up and running. Um, the first day we did 70 something deliveries and that was, we were shocked um, and we were underprepared for it. Um, by the end of the week, we were doing 200 a day um at the height of things in may we were doing 400 to 450 uh uh every thursday friday or saturday and then there were some days we had we just hit shy of 500 um with some of the releases so that put a huge strain on our staff our vehicles our uh production packaging um we were running out of beer quite frequently in in the early well in may june and july i guess um, so, uh, right now it's, it's slowed down, um, or it, it's evened off. I would say, um, last week we did somewhere around on the Friday, we, on a release day, we did somewhere around the 260 mark. 
Um, so yeah, we got a lot of new addresses and uh, we, we did increase it. Um, I believe it was in the fall, we increased it to include Hamilton, Stony Creek, Burlington, Ham, um, did I say Hamilton? Yeah, um, and, and parts of Mississauga. Uh, and we do those two days a week. So um, yeah, we're, we're doing the best we can with the staff we have and the product we have. Um, uh, if uh, if we, we if we try to branch out any further, we'd be running into a lot of inventory and logistical nightmares uh, on a weekly basis. So we're just staying true to what we can do right now. Uh, third beer. Third beer. Lackey, I'll let you. I'll leave it up to you. Do you want pompous ass or Vienna Lager? What would you do? You're on mute, buddy. Vienna. Vienna. All right. So I'm just gonna get up for a second, and we'll we'll grab that. Mike. Well, he's doing that. What do you see that's new and exciting happening in the uh, craft beer industry right now? Yeah, I don't know. It, it seems like everybody's in, uh, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but it seems like everybody's in uh, kind of like just wait and see mode. It doesn't seem like there's much kind of exploding right now. I, I don't know. Seems like everybody is not sure. Like everybody wants to make sure they have cans so they can, you know, keep making beer, keep selling beer, see what's going on around the corner. Hopefully their brew pubs can stay open. Uh, that's what it seems like to me. It seems like a bit of a holding pattern. Okay. But Troy's back. We'll let him uh, take the show now. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so Vienna Lager, I think Lackey's the best one to speak on this one because this is um, uh, the spooning process, uh, which I'm not 100, I know what it is, but he can explain it a lot better. Um, but, uh, well, I'll tell the story before we get into to the actual beer itself. Um, uh, the beer that was the best served with sandwiches, our Red Leaf Lager, um, it was around since 1994. 495. Um, the brewery, as, as much as we try to do good record keeping and archives, um, no one really is sure the exact year that Red Leaf came out. Um, we think it was 94, 95. Anyway, that beer um, went to the LCBO in just 2006 or so, and it lasted a couple years. Um, Rob, you actually might know the answer to that when, when it was pulled out of the LCBO. Um, but, uh, so it, it's been around, it's been a staple. It's been one of those, you know, we have a red lager and we have a blonde lager and those were kind of the names, uh, unofficially, uh, but red leaf lager was always a beer in the, in the Great Lakes, uh, arsenal. And it was pretty much a pub beer. Um, we didn't sell a lot of it at, through the retail store. Um, and going into COVID again, we started to reevaluate some of our, uh, weaker in-house brands. Um, and blonde lager was not one of them, but we just didn't like the recipe as Lackey said, and we wanted to give it a little bit more of a, the Great Lakes look feel and put some creative, um, uh, well, for lack of better, marketing behind it. We couldn't really do that with the blonde lager. That we put the red leaf into a new can. We had new artwork for it, but it still was that beer that no one really talked about. No one really, um, really stood behind. Uh, and then we started doing these alphabet beers that we talked about earlier in the Vienna lager. Every time we came out with it, it would sell very well. And a couple times we ran out of red leaf lager uh, at the retail store. And so our staff would say, we don't have that right now, but we have Vienna. Um, it was a little bit more money, um, but the red leaf drinkers were buying it and liking it. And then it started to outsell the red leaf when we had them together side by side. Um, and so we knew it was the perfect opportunity to make that switch to to pull out of uh, or to get rid of Red Leaf and to move into the Vienna. So um, Lackey and the team uh, tightened up the recipe <clears throat> um, and, and the process. Uh, we we did a couple things differently with the label, and now it's now it's a full time brand. We I can't remember when we just made that announcement. It was like March, the beginning of March. Um, and it's been doing really well uh, in the retail store. And it's only available in retail and home delivery right now. 
Captain Lackey, do you want to talk about the beer? Uh, yeah. So it was uh, originally inspired. I went to uh, a trip, a beer trip, obviously, down to West Virginia and had the Vienna Lager from yeah. Devil's Backbone, which is, they make spectacular lagers. Um, and the Vienna was a real standout. So at that point, it was kind of like, we really have to improve this kind of red leaf, which was somewhat of a Vienna lager, but more Americanized, I guess. Um, so at that point, we started making test batches, uh, pilot batches that uh, inspired by that Devil's Backbone Vienna lager. And uh, it rolled from there. We, uh, again, talking about the spoonding, which is natural carbonation towards the end of fermentation, you cap the fermenter and the CO2, which is produced which is being blown out, just stays in the beer, really helps with head retention, uh, brings all the flavors together, I think, and really kind of transformed the beer for us. So uh, we got to a point where we were happy with it and, and pushed to make it full time. And then, so that's where we are now. We got a pretty nice label and uh, hopefully it goes LCDO someday. And because uh, I think the beer's uh, quite quite nice right now. Nice and smooth. And for anyone that uh, <clears throat> knows the fresh GLB lacing contest that we do every year, um, this one's actually uh, suits that contest really well. Um, so hopefully you're drinking out of a nice clean glass uh, and you'll, you'll see some of the lacing left over from this beer, which is really nice. Uh, there's there's a couple questions there, Bill, if we, you want to. Yeah, I, I was going to get to, if you want to take them, go ahead. Um, There's a lot now. <laughs> <laughs> um, the marketing efforts is for all of, now that you know the areas that are popular, I can't help but focus on market. Yeah. So I'm um, not sure who asked that question. Connecting to audio. Um, Graham yeah, asked that. Graham. Um, <laughs> Uh, so in the beginning, Graham, what we did, uh, we did an old school marketing um, mail out. We went to and we got custom cards um, printed uh, and they look like cans, like an actual tall boy can. And we sent those to postal codes in and around the brewery. Uh, we did that for uh, phase one of uh, phase one of phase one uh, to let people know that we were doing home delivery. Um, we waited a couple weeks and then we hit another postal code and we waited to see what kind of results that would bring. Uh, and then we did that six months after the fact, there was four months after the fact, it was six months into the new year. So it was July. Um, and then we targeted some areas that we saw some strength in. Um, and we also looked at, uh, there's a program called dig this data where we could see, uh, where our LCBO sales were coming from, what stores were big for us. And then we could focus on those postal codes to then send these home delivery uh, notifications through Canada Post to those households. Uh, and then we could see where the home deliveries were coming from um, based on the success of that small mail, old school mail program, uh, which worked. Um, uh, we, we've done a couple of things with uh, uh, Facebook targeted ads and Google, but um, everyone's doing those. And so you really got to stand out. Um, I know creative to is on the call creative or uh, collective has done some very creative uh, Facebook ads that pop up everywhere. And it has all the color and the paint kind of going all over and it, it looks so awesome. Um, and that's going to catch your eye a lot more than just a pint glass standing there saying, Hey, we home deliver. <clears throat> so um, is dad body coming back? Um, I think we're doing it for Father's Day this year. We just talked about it last week or so. Forgot about that. Yeah. So they got to brew it this week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Text Nick right now, actually. <laughs> change change of plans. Tomorrow morning, yeah. we need to get this done. <laughs> um, Literally. <laughs> <laughs> well, while he's doing that text, Troy, I'll ask you another question, okay? Because uh, I, I asked Mike while you were away from it, what do you see that's new and exciting happening in the craft beer industry right now? Um, it's a lot. Um, <clears throat> I see people like uh, Rob from Shortfinger doing all these crazy experimentation <laughs> beers. Um, 
I think that's uh, that's unique right now, and that's it, that's exploding. Um, seltzers and the the craft ready to drink cocktails, which were we've now entered that realm. Um, Great Lake Spirits is alive, and our vodka soda is going to um, uh, the LCBO. It should be there now. So I haven't checked uh, the LCBO uh, website today to see if it is, but uh, that's going out. And then, yeah, we got into seltzers. Uh, we've done two so far, um, Spritzy Spritzy Raspberry and uh, Pacific Delight. Um, but I'm going to say home delivery has been the biggest, um, the biggest one. Uh, there's a lot of the smoothie sours and all that stuff going on, but I think home delivery has been the story of COVID. Um, uh, just a lot of breweries are doing really well with it. Um, it's made up all of our tap room um, missed opportunities and event opportunities. Uh, so I look at it from a Great Lakes perspective. I would say home delivery has been the biggest one. Yep. And, and then breweries allowing, like <clears throat> we've been doing it for over 10 years now allowing breweries to just or brewers to just in just make a whole bunch of one-offs all the time just you're seeing every brewery come out every week with something new or every two weeks with something new um back in 2010 12 13 14 gray lakes was one of the only breweries that was doing that consistently but it was on a very small basis and now uh ramping up over those years i think a lot of other breweries have seen that model and it's worked for us and it's worked for some others and and that's what they're doing. Mike, big change in uh, not being able to travel. I mean, you and um, Peter and, and Ian from uh, Amsterdam would go to Yakima for hops. You're not able to do that now. How's that affected the quality of the hops that you're receiving? Uh, well, we, we have basically one supplier for our hops. Uh, so we buy a lot and they come to us, they came to us this year. So they brought samples of hops uh, and we did a rub at the brewery uh, virtual with, with people from Yakima, just kind of talking about them. And um, so it has not affected the quality of hops, but actually I'm going to say, I'm going to change that. If I, if you're talking to Peter, it has vastly affected them and we have to go every year to Yakima. Uh, so yeah, I don't want to uh, lose that trip every year because it's very important that we go there. But yeah, as, as long as as long as we have the rub and they, they make uh, Yakima Chief make sure that we, we get some good, good hops and we have the rub. So we were able to select uh, nice hops again. Uh, but hopefully we're going back next year. We'll see. I know you probably missed jumping into the hop pile. That was a fantastic video of Peter. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, yeah, we have a lot of fun down there. It's amazing. I asked them to recreate that uh, the last time, but using Griff uh, and unfortunately they didn't, they didn't get to that. That would have been a good video. One of our other brewers. Yeah. We would have left Griff there. <laughs> I can see that. Um, uh, what is lacing um, from Graham? Um, before I pour a beer into another glass, um, lacing is when you get uh, the head retention. Uh, as you drink, you'll get the lacing of the head retention as, or the, the head of the beer that sticks to the sides of the glass. Um, it shows you have a good clean glass, a nice fresh beer, a good quality made beer with good ingredients. Um, it's served at the proper temperature. Uh, one of the things when you go into a bar or restaurant, you'll see quite often they'll do the spritz of the the glass um, on a behind the bar, or whatever. They'll turn it upside down, and one of the reasons they're doing that is to get the the glass up to the temperature of the beer that's coming from the taps. Um, it's also hopefully removing any uh, lint or anything that's stuck inside the glass. Um, uh, but that's why you know putting your glass in a freezer is no good for beer. Um, uh, and then it, it shows, you can see like counting the rings on a tree, you can see how many sips you've taken, uh, to get to the bottom. Um, and so we, we hold a contest every year. Um, and it's quite, it's quite awesome to see all the pictures of, uh, that people send in. I think you're saying like, you did it. Yeah. I'm, I'm my picture or my, uh, 
what's that game called? Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we should um, we should get to the fourth beer now. Pompous ass. So I was just pouring it out when uh, when Graham asked that. Um, yeah. Pompous ass is our our version of an English ale. Um, it's got Sir Fuggle double bottom on the can. Um, it's a 4.2%. Um, uh, it is a very unique English ale, uh, but I'll let Lackey talk about the ingredients and why it's so unique. Um, but the, the neat story behind uh, Pompous Ass, it doesn't get told a lot because it's one of those beers that, you know, Canuck gets a lot of love. Um, Octopus Wants to Fight is number, I, I'm going to have to ask like Tomas, Tomas would know like number six or seven in the province right now. Um, yeah. Um, and so those two beers get a lot of love. And then because we do so many one-offs, all the one-offs and the seasonal beers like Sunnyside, Moxie and um, Thrust and so on and so forth, those beers get a lot more love than Pompous Ass does. Um, Pompous Ass was the first beer that we launched from the pilot system up to the Tank 10 system or Tank 10 um, series. And it replaced Devil's Pale Ale as a, as a full-time brand in 2014, uh, 2014, 2015. Um, and, and so it's been with us that long. And it's, it's uh, one of those beers that just doesn't get talked about that much. And then you have one and, and you're, shit, this is a really good beer. It's such a solid beer. Um, and I actually wrote down in 2020, I do one of those, those you know, my goals for the year. Um, and it really was to drink more pompous ass to just give it some more love, uh, because it is such a is such a good beer, and that four point two percent ABV is really nice as well too. So, um, it went through a, a huge makeover. So, if you look at uh, the Canuck Pale Ale, if you look at Canuck Pale Ale, it's the same look, it's the same uh, pose, it's the same character. Um, it was just done in Patrick's way with pompous ass. It's a whole new character. Um, the nose is gone from the other character. He's a little bit more refined. It's like, he's going to the prom. He's dressed up a little nicer than the other guy. He's cleaner. Um, and uh, so we're really happy with the way this one turned out. Uh, the cans just came in and uh, around November, um, December. So these ones are all rolling out to grocery stores and LCBOs right now. Um, and it's only two seventy five a can, which is the crazy, crazy part. It's a very affordable beer. Um, and uh, Lackey, do you want to talk about what makes it so unique? Uh, well, yeah. So Pompous was, I think, I think it was one of the first recipes done on that little uh, fifty liter pilot system, uh, that in Canuck. Um, and it, it was kind of originally, it was a bit of a hybrid. American uh, English style, which is kind of what we were doing at the time. It had a little Simcoe dry hop, which is Simcoe's uh, a pretty classic West Coast, one of the first West Coast kind of grapefruity hops that came out. Um, but to be honest, over the years, we've kind of gone back to more English. We, we took the Simcoe out. Um, the main hop is Styrian Golding, which is actually grown in Slovenia. But it's uh, it is it's the, the root or the stock is uh, is golding from England. So, but it gives a real nice tea flavor, black tea, which I've always thought is it's just great. Um, and as we've gone made it more English, uh, we we changed the yeast, and I think that kind of made it fruitier, brought that tea out, uh, some of the dark fruits out more and really put it in a spot where it's unique, but is different for us. Uh, it also gives us an opportunity to, uh, without getting too technical, to grow uh, a London yeast, which we don't have a dry hop in, so we can use that London yeast to make uh, the New England styles, uh, which have dry hops during fermentation. You can't reuse the, the yeast. So we use our uh, the uh, the pompous ass is 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 a growth for yeast for haze mama and burst any other New England styles that we that we are making on the small system. So it's a the brewers really like it. It's uh, logistically great, and then but the, the beer whenever I have it, same as Troy said, you, I mean we kind of forget it about it, the brewery sometimes, 
but uh, whenever I have one, I, I really enjoy it too. And so just on what Lackey said, our pompous ass won't be going away anytime soon because uh, we need that, uh, we need the yeast. Yeah, um, <laughs> but it and sells. So if when we look at sales at the end of the year, you know, uh, you know, brands will be up and down and there'll be some trends and, and time of year uh, changes the sales, but pompous kind of stays the same all year. It's the same, you know, 127 people drinking it or, or <laughs> and they're drinking a lot and, uh, but they drink the same amount. They drink their eight, eight cans a week or whatever it is. Cause it doesn't change. Amazing. Uh, when we go back to bars and restaurants being able to pour, and we, we saw it for a little bit, uh, we made the choice um, about a year ago, or just before COVID, we made the choice, and then we were getting to the point where uh, Pompas would only be served on draft uh, via nitro. Um, so the brewery invested in that, and uh, a lot of bars uh, received creamer, creamer faucets. Um, Beer Town, so Beer Town Waterloo, Beer Town... Is the Guelph one open? Beer Town Guelph? Um, no, I guess they no. Beer Town Barry. Uh, so they're all pouring pompous nitro uh, when when they are open, which is um, really exciting. Uh, but but bars across Toronto started to to catch on and and do a, do that, and um, it's a whole different. It changes the whole complexion of the beer. Um, and uh, I know a lot of people go to Bryden's uh, on Bloor. Uh, and tried it for the first time, and that's where people started drooling. <laughs> Some asses shaking his head, never heard of it. <laughs> Two o'clock siestas, uh, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, yeah, so once once we get back to bar and restaurants being open, uh, you'll you'll be able to experience pompous on nitro, which is uh, a whole other whole other game. Imagine, I do remember that change, by the way, from Devil's Pale Ale. Oh, and, we got some news about Devils. Devils is coming back yeah. this year. Yeah, it's going to come back <laughs> to the LCBO. Um, it's all about retro this year, it seems like, going back to the old school label of the lager. But yeah. uh, Devils is coming back for a quick run to the LCBO in the fall. Yeah, but I was going to say you were right. I, I when, when Troy told me we were taking Devils Pale and it was being replaced, I was like, no, you can't do that. <laughs> and then when I got to try Papa's ass, it was like, okay, I can live with this. <laughs> Uh, there was some diehards. Um, everyone in everyone in Ontario should know uh, the bar, the only cafe on the Danforth. Well, that that place, Ronnie's local in Kensington Market, uh, Sauce on Danforth. Those three bars literally kept that beer alive um, because they would order they would order a lot, uh, a lot of kegs. And uh, every day at four o'clock at the end of the bar in the only cafe, you could see Murph and all the boys, and they would be they were all construction and trades. They would end their day and drink six pints there every day, and so those guys kept uh, that beer alive for a little too long. So GLB hits uh, thirty-five next year, eh? It's about ten yeah. months away. Is there anything you can share with us on what the upcoming plans are for celebrating the thirty-fifth? Uh, uh, for those of you who know us, we plan for the week, the next week. We don't plan for ten months. <laughs> um, but I uh, know we we have chatted briefly about some some ideas and some things. Um, we're gonna have the brew pub open, um, hopefully. Um, everyone get vaccinated. Um, we're gonna have the brew pub open, and the goal is to um, uh, really have that spot as a collaboration piece uh, for a thirty fifth year. Is to be doing a lot of bringing in a lot of our friends from the industry to do a lot of different collabs. Um, so those will be brewed at the brew pub, um, but we will also probably do, you know, a beer there, a beer at the brewery and get those beers out. So um, I like what Amsterdam has done in their 35th. So some, a shout out to Amsterdam. They're recreating a lot of their old uh, recipes for the 35th. Some really great beers to check out from, from Ian and Cody. Um, so that um, and then we'll, we'll likely, if we can, throw a massive party on February 12th again if everything's open down at the brew pub so we have our own spot to throw a party now so we'll, we'll do it up quite big because we missed it last year <laughs> we've, all year. Missed, we, yeah. we've all missed we've all missed a yeah. year <laughs> mike is there a question we should go back to it's in the chat thing um 
how do you and the, the, the guys brewing with you decide who's brewing what and what's the brainstorming session like when you're deciding what to brew? Um, well, it's usually just someone will throw something out and like, oh, that's a good idea. And if it's something new, I mean, the most exciting thing is when, and it maybe it takes a bit to get out of some of the younger guys sometimes, but it's like, what do you want to do? What do you, uh, I want to do this. It's like, well, why didn't you say that earlier? Like, let's do that. That's great. So it, it, it's kind of uh, just bringing new ideas out. And uh, I mean, back in the day when people would travel, they'd come back. Like, so Nick Perry, speaking about the English ales and the, the Monty series, he went to England and, you know, enjoyed uh, uh, the cast beer there and the, the English tiles, obviously. And he he started doing home brews with all of them. And then it was like, I have all these recipes and it's like, fantastic run with it. So usually it's, um, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of that someone will be inspired by something. Someone has done a home brew where they want to do this. Someone has tried a beer where they, they, they want to emulate that. And then it's, it's, it's an easy choice. It's like, Oh, that's something new. That's cool. So let's, let's try that. One of our newer seller staff uh brewers bethune created the uh, pixie series or created the beers um uh which was our first foray into a dry hop sour at the brewery um which was pretty great and then uh and nick uh with his um with his english styles and then griff with his shinny pants and yeah so it's it's a great team of guys that um are really talented and uh, Florin, they would make for a good Zoom call one day uh, to get to get Griff on for a whole hour to talk. That would be something. And then, <laughs> and certainly uh, Matt Bod, who's uh, joined our team as a distiller, um, uh, I guess in in title, but he's got a lot of brewing ideas too. Matt was the brewer at Bar Hop. I uh, was making some great beers there, so he's brought a lot of new ideas to us and. Um, we're doing a lot of can conditioning now, which he inspired, which has transformed some of the, the styles we've done and they're, they're tasting great. Um, but that's something we wouldn't have done without mm -hmm. Matt kind of saying, hey, let's do some can conditioning. That, that's all he was doing at that bar off. They were doing keg conditioning. So he has yeah. the techniques down and he under, he's understanding the, the flavors that the, that the can conditioning brings to the beer, the different things it brings to the beer. So he's done some recipes and they've turned out fantastic too. So he's a great addition as well. Yeah. If anyone hasn't tried our old Dusseldorf alt beer yet, I'd highly recommend trying to get down to the brewery to grab some if you're into the home delivery zone. Uh, it's been my beer of 2021. It's um, we, did, we did it early in, or late in 2020 and I, I begged them to bring it back uh, soon. And it's a, it's a fantastic beer all, all the way around. Um, there's a couple more questions before we get to Moxie. Do you want to do those now or do you want to? It, well, I, I was flipping a coin whether I was going to ask Mike by, uh, if he could give us the backstory on um, the name Moxie. Well, let's crack the beer when he, when he does that then. Okay. And then we can get back to the questions that we've missed. <laughs> I see some people are already into the Moxie, which is good. So uh, yeah, Moxie uh, was, again, it's going to kind of make me uh, a little melancholy speaking about, you know, trips and beer trips and going to uh, Washington. Uh, but I think 2017 or something, 16 or 17, we went down to Yakima for a trip. And there's a farm in Moxie, Washington, which is a little outside of the town of Yakima in the same valley. And uh, it's a tiny little town, uh, farmer town. And we went to one farm at like 7 a.m. We woke up really early. We were on a tight schedule. Uh, Ian McCoostra was on the trip from Amsterdam. And we were with these English guys. And we went to this farm. It was a 20-minute tour. They were quick. They were like, we're in harvest. We can't really spend much time with you. And we were done. And then the next tour wasn't until 11 or something like that. So we, were, we had four or five hours and we were just in this little town with nothing. 
And we were like, are we going back to the hotel? And these English guys were like, no, we're just going to go to the coffee shop and hang out. And it was, Ian and I were like, what the hell are you talking about? But it was it was fun. We went to this coffee shop. We sat on the patio and we, we drank coffee and just chatted with these these uh, these English brewers and just kind of watched this town of Moxie go by, which was, there wasn't much going on. Uh, there was a bit of tumbleweed, like actual tumbleweed going down the main street, which was just like, wow. This is, this is something else. So it was, it was quite the experience. And it's one of those things you get when you go on trips like that. And it, I, as much as I thought it sucked at the time, it was like, that was, that was an amazing experience and never forget it. And it, it brought, you know, inspired the beer coming back. So, um, it, so the, the next farm we went to was CLS farms and their specialty is El Dorado hops. And it's their propri proprietary hop. And when we got there, they were actually harvesting it. And just the whole, I mean, again, another amazing experience. The whole air just smelled of this amazing melony hop, which I had never experienced before. So, and you're just picking it up off the, off the dirt and rubbing it, just going, oh my God, this is incredible. So it's like, okay, we're making a beer with this hop. It's going to have something to do with Moxie and uh, this, this kind of cool experience we had in uh, moxie washington so and it's such a great story it almost got us sued <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> in a gas station yeah. <laughs> so, um it was one of the most memorable moments of my time at great lakes and i really wish i recorded the conversation um it started with a voicemail a very angry voicemail and then it ended up with a, a 20 minute conversation with uh, the elderly um, owner of uh, the muffler shop on the My muffler shop, yeah. <laughs> um, I, and with his his accent, he was going on how we. I hear you big guys up there in Canada have a beer with my with my muffler shop on it. My buddy Bob told me I should be getting royalties from every can you sell. Um, and he went on and I couldn't get in, a word in and he went on and on about, okay, when are you going to pay me? And well, I, I didn't approve the logo or the, the label and all this stuff. And then whatever we get off the phone, I get a call like 20 minutes later from his son going, it's all good, man. Just send us a case. Like, <laughs> this is great. Nothing ever happens cool like this in Moxie. Um, and then the hop supplier that uh, Mike was talking about, or Lackey was talking about, uh, reached out to the muffler shop and the, the crew and they were going to, we were going to send beer to them to do a tasting and then they were going to take it over. So um, never did hear back from the muffler shop after that, but the, the, the old man was not happy Yeah, Bob's garage from Schitt's Creek. It, he sounded a little bit more mean than uh, Bob. from <laughs> Schitt's Creek. He was not a happy guy uh, until his son came on, but you could hear, you could hear his buddy in the background telling him, no, 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 don't. You got to get money from them. You got to get some money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this one went through this, this can always, it seems like every time we do it, we, we redo the can. So we, we brightened up the colors, um, gave it a little bit more, um, moved it into the middle. Cause sometimes it would stretch out over the side of the can. So you couldn't see the whole image from, by looking at it uh, onwards. Um, we, we emphasized whatever the hell that they have up on top of the muffler shop. What is that, Lackey, a dog or a dinosaur? Dinosaur, dinosaur. yeah. Um, and uh, it comes out around this time every year um, to the LCBO. And then we did it a couple times throughout the year uh, just for the retail store uh, and home delivery. Uh, but it is one of our most popular IPAs next to, um, or for our one-off series of Thrust and, and Karma Citra for sure. And it drinks so easily. It's a, one of those, uh, I know you heard me say this before, but it's a sneaky bugger where someone will sit down and drink two or three of these because they drink so easy and then they go to get up and um, their legs are like cement. Um, yeah, so it's available at the LCBO right now. It's three fifty dollars a can. All of our New England style IPAs are priced at three fifty. dollars um, and it's here and gone. So um, the can I had dropped off yesterday was the 6th of April. Um, so I'm not sure, Lucky, is that the last run? Do you recall? 
I do we have maybe one more. Sounds about like their last run, yeah. Yeah. And then we're we'll be we've moved on to sunny side and we have Tango, uh Tart Wheatail, and um Great Lakes Lager. So we have both of those coming out alongside vodka soda with citrus. So um we're gonna have like nine SKUs in the L C B O as of hopefully next uh in the next two weeks, which is which is nice. Which kind of ties into the question that's here. Tomas is not impressed. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask how many does. I was going to say Collective Arts probably has 25. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Including that new one with granola in it today. I saw that one. Granola and berries. And... He hasn't even heard about that. <laughs> That's number 26. Um, there's a question off the record question. You have so many SKUs at LCBO at any given time. Challenging to ensure availability. Um, so uh, we've been pretty lucky. Um, you, we, I think we'd want to say we're very strategic in what we do and it's got a lot better, but we're pretty much brewing or packaging beer for orders that have already happened. Um, that's why when we, we started to say fresh GLB years ago, um, we could actually really stand behind it uh, because we knew the beers that are being canned are already going to an LCBO tomorrow that'll be on shelves and sold within the weekend. So it's up to the customer at that time to then drink the beer fresh, which hopefully everyone does because you don't sit on bread for a month. Um, uh, so we have a really good sales team that are consistently making sure our day codes are good. And if they're not, we had someone just last week on Twitter, I think we put out a tweet saying something about fresh GLB and someone said, oh, okay, so what's your what's your threshold? And we said, like 90 days maximum if there's anything 91 days let us know we'll come and get it um and if it's stored warm you know we don't say it publicly but it's like two months if it's on a warm shelf for two months we're gonna go back and get those back um so this guy held up the can and took a picture and it was february 28th or the last day of february um and then we looked in the system and we we're like that that lcbo has got like six orders since that time so they're not rotating properly. So we had a staff member when you could, you can't do it as of this week, I think, but uh, the staff member went into the store to make sure that they were rotating and they had a talk with the staff to ensure that stocks were being rotated properly. Um, when it comes to our, our replacing a SKU with another SKU, um, I, I don't want to say we have it dialed in because I don't think anyone will ever, ever dialed in uh, the way you want it to be, but um, when Moxie is running empty on store shelves, so when we've quit selling to the LCBO, we know that Tango is coming in right behind it. So we give ourselves like a two to three week buffer so that we can kind of blow out inventory. So uh, if you try it as far back as I can remember IPA, that one came and we stopped selling once we sold out. Two weeks goes by, Moxie goes into the LCBO. So there will be some crossover, but at, a lot of the times we have LCBO ambassadors that understand what we're trying to do and they'll just give us that other listing until until that um, tank 10 seasonal one kind of uh, windows down and then they'll move on to the next one. So I hope that answered the question. I... Yeah, now Jen's question is one of the ones that I had is uh, Mike, I've lost track of the number of people I have spoken to this year on Beers with Bill who list you as one of the most influential people that got them into brewing and brewing their own and, and into their own brewery. And, and so Jen was curious as to how many people <laughs> you think have traveled through GLB and brewed beer with you who are now brewery owners. Brewery owners? Or working, uh, working in other breweries. Brewers, yeah. Um, oh, geez, I don't know. A lot. Bobo. <laughs> um, Rob, short finger, uh, is great. Oh, that's really <laughs> <laughs> um, we have uh, oh, yeah. okay. Goose Cam Island, Royal City, Cam, um, Royal City, yeah, uh, uh Mark at uh, Goose Island, Blake yeah. at OT in Calgary, not um, OT anymore, but no, yeah, whatever, yeah, that brewery, um, Tim Ferryman, wherever he's at now. Um, he, he's starting a new, uh, new company. 
Um, yeah, I don't know. Emily, Emily's at Forked River. I think seven or eight, I would say, but maybe there's more. There's probably a lot more that worked at Great Lakes at one point, maybe not necessarily as in the brew house that have gone on to work in breweries that um, Mike has been instrumental with helping out. Um, in 2017, our 30th anniversary, we we went around the province. We had people come to Great Lakes, but we also went around the province and brewed with as many people as we could. And I can remember the conversation with Mike then. It was, um, let's kind of, it sounds cliche, but he's like, let's give back. Like we've been here 30 years. We're the elder states people of, uh, of craft beer. Let's work with some of the younger breweries and do some stuff with them. Um, and so that's what we did. And we had a very scary uh, motel experience in Alora. Um, that uh, we did three days on the road and that was, uh, we checked in late at that uh, motel, but it was, uh, Mike's always been very, um, very um, generous with his time, his knowledge. He's given away a lot of knowledge uh, which, where he shouldn't have. He posted the original Canuck recipe on Bar Towel one time for everyone to have. Um, I had to take so, that down. Yeah, and I think I think there's another brewery in this province that um, that uh, copied it before he got it off uh, uh, the site. Um, but he's always brought in people um, to the brewery, and he's always been same with Peter just an open book which can sometimes be detrimental to uh to where the person goes next but it's if they're brewing great beer it's it's great beer and it's great fun yeah so naomi had a couple of questions up she was curious and troy you probably can answer this best have has people has the taste that people like in beer changed during the pandemic uh, I, I don't know about during the pandemic, but um, everyone's drinking New England IPAs and New England pale ales these days. Um, and if you would have asked, you, if you would have asked Lackey or myself uh, three years ago, Lackey, I think we were at Hunger Brew Ups one time and Boris was like, when are you guys going to get into this East Coast IPA? And we we're like, ah, I don't know. We like our West Coast. Um and then it became, look at us now, we, we get, we get, um, there's some people out there in the, the social media atmosphere that think all we do are New England IPAs and New England pale ales. We have to remind them very um, politely that, well, you, why don't you just take a look at our year long list of, um, of all the beers and styles we've done. I think loggers are coming back. I think everyone thinks that, everyone knows that. Uh, that's why we focused a lot on the German loggers. But it's not because that's what people are drinking. I think that's what we like to drink too. We've gone to that. Um, Lackey, what are you drinking right now? You're not uh, drinking the monster. Yeah, yeah, so he's yeah. still drinking the abstract. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so you look in my recycling bin at the house, it's all Humber Hellas right now. Um, and a lot of our staff are drinking um, uh, the lager series, whether the German Pilsners or the Great Lakes lager or whatever. So I think those two are still... Sours have kind of, you know, there was a great post by um, Brewdog uh, out of the UK saying they invested in this huge, massive um, sour experimental side of the business, only to realize that people drink two at a time and then that's it. They're done for the day. Whereas if you're drinking a nice, well-made uh, pale ale, like a Canuck, you're drinking four, five, six. Um, and so they've, they've realized that sours aren't going to push their, their brewery forward uh, on a grand scale. Um, and then you look at the smoothies that are out there right now. And I think, Bill, you asked this last, or you asked me last time if we were ever going to do a smoothie. Um, <laughs> and so I'll let Lackey answer that question uh, since he's here. But I, I don't think so. But uh, I would just say that what kind of like as Troy was uh, more to what Troy was saying, we, we, we brew what we like to drink, you know, around the brewery, we talk about it, we live kind of love beer. So we brew what we like to drink. And then hopefully that, and we think it will, you know, trickle down to customers. And uh, if you brew it with, you know, passion and, and, and you know, that like you're enjoying it, then other people will probably enjoy it, you know, at some point. Uh, hopefully they will. Uh, so we don't try to 
chase trends too much unless we like them. So I don't know if I like a slush. I haven't had a slushy, but if I really liked it or if one of the other young brewers did, then I'm then maybe we would try it. I don't know. Definitely going to have to get you and Rob to do a collab slushy now. Okay, I'm in. You talked me into it. I had a short finger, Lots though. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not into it, Rob. Yeah. I will find someone else. We'll get uh, Collective. Tomas. Find out. <laughs> okay, Tomas is in. All right. We love the guys from uh, Third Moon. We really do. And this is no shade whatsoever thrown on them. But uh, if you have to go through all that trouble to warn people about how to store your beer, when to drink it, how to, uh, that's a little bit too much for us. And Again, we love those guys. We we were supposed to be doing a collab with them, two collabs with them uh, this week, um, but COVID. Um, uh, and yeah. I think that's that's a lot to go through just to to sell a four dollar can of beer when uh, you can you can do without naming a name. You can throw one of our beers, Sunnyside, uh, for two ninety and, and ensure that people are going to have a good experience with it every time. So I'm going to ask one last question. It's the same one for both of you. Mike, if you could spend one day brewing with anybody, who would it be? Bobo. <laughs> I knew he was going to say that. <laughs> Bobo. Yeah. And you're going to do a slushy, right? No. <laughs> Only if it's a slushy, though. <laughs> Why Bobo? Uh, Wintry subs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, they have good subs up there. Uh, yeah, Munchy subs, yeah, perfect. Uh, no, I brewed with Bobo and it was great, but I would, uh, I'll say Vinny Caruso, uh, Russian river. That was a big influence. So probably him. Uh, that's what I would say, but Rob, Rob's great too. He, he probably will say no. So Rob and I can, we'll have a good time. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Troy, who would you spend a day either brewing or, or chalking beer with? Well, uh, we actually did it, but we, we did it virtually. And I wish, because we had it lined up, Charlie Papazian was supposed to come to Great Lakes, uh, spend a day with us, brew a beer. Um, and then he, we were going to tour him around um, Ontario breweries for a couple days. Um, for those that, that don't know, Charlie is the, he's, he's called the godfather of craft beer in, in America. He started the American Home Brewers Association, fought, to change legislation in the U.S. to make home brewing legal because it wasn't legal until 19, I think it was 1970 or something like that. Um, so yeah, we we did a beer with him um, for the Ontario Craft Brewers Conference uh, September this year, but we did it virtually. So uh, that guy's just he's traveled the world. All he does is all he does is talk about beer, uh, drinks beer. Um, and even through the virtual hangout that we did, he, he was just awesome to talk beer with. Um, so many great stories. So it would be Charlie. Yeah. Listen, Mike, Troy, thank you for being on the show tonight and giving us the gift of your time. It's always a pleasure, Troy, to see you. Mike, I am so glad to meet the person I think who's sort of the godfather of the craft beer industry in Southern Ontario. Thank you for being on the show. Uh, everybody next week, uh, Marvin Dick, Wellington Brewery is going to be on with me and um, joining him is going to be Wilma Zondak, the uh, founder of the Queens of Beer. And I will be getting an email out later tomorrow with the beers that we're going to be doing because we're still tidying that list up. And uh, May has really turned out well. Uh, Peter Collins, TWB is joining me on May the 4th. We'll be releasing the collab. They're going to be bottling it later next week. So it'll be available for uh, uh, our uh, chat on the 4th of May. Show number 52, Keith Carmen is joining me. He wanted to bookend the beginning of the first year and the ending of the second year. And then um, Hartwood Cidery is going to join me for the, 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 the show. And then the last week of May, Richard Price from Escarpment Labs will be in to talk to us about that aspect of brewing beer. Thank you everybody for joining in. I am gonna stop recording now.